And now in our final explanation of difficult scriptures to understand in the New Testament, we have come to the book of Galatians. Now here is a favorite or one of the most favorite verse uh, of the Protestant world, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. It is absolutely amazing. It is stunning how twisted in their interpretation this verse gets. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, some, or I would better say millions, have wondered or millions have claimed that what is meant by being hung on a tree, and millions have said that uh, those who keep the law, the law of God, that they are actually cursed. But the question we can ask, other than responding to that silly, silly notion, was Jesus hung on a tree or was he, was he crucified? Well, the New Testament uses Greek word for tree, xylon, only five times to refer to Christ's death, and the reference are found in Acts chapter 5 verse 30, Acts 10 verse 39, Acts 13 verse 29, here in Galatians 3 12, and in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. Most of the time, the Greek noun stauros, meaning stake, and verb stauro, meaning crucified, describe Jesus Christ's death. These two words appear 74 times in the New Testament. Now, one of the five appearances of Xylon occurs in Galatians 3.13. In this case, Paul was quoting a phrase found in Deuteronomy 21.23. Paul was referring to the Torah's prescribed form of execution. Torah meaning the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch in the Bible. So he is, Paul is referring to the Pentateuch of the five books, prescribed form of execution by stoning for certain offenses such as blasphemy and idolatry. And after being stoned to death, the person's body was hung on a tree to show the individuals under God's curse. To the Jews, hanging on a tree had become a metaphor for an apostate a blasphemer, or a person deemed under God's curse. That is exactly how the Jews viewed Jesus, of course, in John chapter 5, verse 18, in chapter 10 of John, verse 33, and in Matthew 26, verses 63 through 65. Their attitude would explain why Peter and Paul on occasion used the Greek word for tree to describe Jesus' execution, even though he was crucified on a stake of some sort. Three times in the book of Acts, the word tree is used to refer to Jesus' murder. In these, case, in these cases, it appears in Jewish context as well. For example, Paul, or that is Peter, told the Jewish authorities they had killed Christ by hanging him on a tree. Acts chapter 5 verse 30. Peter was denouncing them for wrongly having exposed Jesus to a humiliating death. But said Peter, God had glorified Jesus by raising him from raising him from the dead. Acts chapter five, verse thirty-one. Now Peter obviously did not mean to say the Jews had actually carried out a crucifixion. When Pilate suggested that the Jewish religious leaders judge Jesus, Jesus, they said, "We have no right to execute anyone." John chapter eighteen, verse thirty-one. Now Peter's remark to the religious authorities was meant to point out something else. By clamoring to the Roman authorities for Jesus Christ's death, it is as though they personally had hung him on a tree as a blasphemer or criminal. In any case, crucifixion of criminals was not a Jewish practice. Besides, as the Dictionary of New Testament Theology states, in Judea, at the time of Jesus, sentencing to death was entirely in the hands of the Roman authorities. The Romans did not often hang criminals from trees. When they executed criminals, the Romans used some form of a stake, a platform that sometimes, but not always, had a crossbar attached to the main stake. So that's why we believe that Jesus Christ was really, actually, it was not the cross, and there was no, and the, the execution which took place in his case was not with a crossbar uh, being uh, attached to the main stake that he was, you know, he was crucified, he was crucified on a tree. Now for the followers of Christ, the burden of the stake has special symbolism because Jesus said in Matthew 10 verse 38, anyone who does not take his stauros and follow me is not worthy of me. He also said, if anyone would come after me, 
he must deny himself and take up his stauros daily. He said it in Luke chapter 9 verse 23. Now carrying the stauros is a meaningful analogy. When the Romans executed some individuals, the condemned man was forced to carry the stake on which his body would be nailed or tied to the execution site. The suffering of the execution itself made the stake a dramatic symbol of pain, distress and burden bearing. Jesus used the Staurus as a symbol to portray the spiritual sacrifice required of his followers. And we are in Galatians 3 and in verse 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot this annual that it should make the promise of non-effect. Now this is a bit archaic English, it's the old King James. Nevertheless you have the modern translations, but you can, so you can check what it says in your uh, modern translation. But there are those of you who do still understand the old King James anyway. So some believe that this scripture, which is difficult to understand, that this scripture contradicts Genesis 15.13 and Acts chapter 7 and verse 6, which mentions 430 years. So the question is, why is there a difference? Well, you see, since Galatians 3.17 states that the law was given 430 years after the covenant was made, it is evident that the 430 years began when Abraham was 99 years old and ended the year of the exodus of his descendants out of Egypt in 1443 before Christ and their appearance at Sinai. The law was given on the day of Pentecost, 1443 before Christ, soon after Israel left Egypt. Notice I say Israel, not Jews. Jews are one tribe of Israel. The house of Israel is made up of 12 tribes. So Israel left Egypt. The 430 years period begins with the confirming of the covenant. That was 1873 before Christ. And ends with Exodus 1443 before Christ. Genesis 17, verse 1 and verse 2. Genesis 17, 1-2 shows that Abraham was 99 years old when the covenant was made. Israel left Egypt 430 years after the covenant was made with Abraham. Exodus 12, verse 40, in the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint version, reads as follows. The time that the sons of Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan was... 430 years. Now, the dwelling period of Israel in Egypt extended from Jacob's bringing his family into Egypt during the famine to Israel's exodus. So, that will be 1682 through uh, all the way to 1443 before Christ, or 239 years. Galatians 3.17 shows that the law was given 430 years after God made the covenant with Abraham. Paul therefore accepted the this uh, chronology that we have just read from the Septuagint version. Now this chronology is also supported by the genealogy of Exodus 6 verses 14 through 20, which allows only four generations between Jacob and Moses. And there is reason to think that the genealogical table has been abridged. The, 400, uh, the 430 years mentioned in Exodus 12 verse 40 began with the confirming of the covenant that God made with Abraham when Abraham was 99 years old in 1873 before Christ. Please notice Genesis 17 and we'll be reading the first 10 verses in Genesis 17. Or just uh, perhaps a part of it. But anyway, it says that when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be you perfect. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to uh, your seed after you. 
And then Genesis 21, verses 1 through 5, continues the story. Sarah finally, finally became pregnant at the set time, as it says in verse 2. And this physical evidence fully confirmed the covenant. And Isaac, the son of the promise, was born in 1872 before Christ, when Abraham was 100 years old. That's in verse 5, Genesis 21, 5. Now Genesis 15, 3 states that Abraham's seed... Uh, so his seed, not Abraham, but Abraham's seed, which is mentioned also in Acts 7, verse 6. So Abraham's seed, not Abraham, was to be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now this would be the length of time from the death of Abraham, which was 76 years after the covenant was made. So you can compare to establish that Genesis 25, 7 with Genesis 17, 1. So this will be the length of the time from the death of Abraham uh, through the 40 years wandering to the division of the land when the children of Israel received their inheritance under the direction of Joshua. This occurred six years after they entered the land of Canaan. And the, to prove that, you have Numbers 10, 1, 10, verse 11, that is, and Joshua 14, verses 7 through 10. So the 400 years began, begins with the death of Abraham, that was 1797 before Christ, and ends when Israel divided the promised land, which was 1397 before Christ. Abraham lived to be 175 years old. The proof of that is Genesis 25 verse 7. 76 years after the covenant was made. Abraham was 99 years old when the covenant was made. Abraham's seed was oppressed 400 years, says in Acts 7 verse 6, in a land not theirs, says in Genesis 15 verse 13. The promised land was divided in 1397 before Christ, Joshua 13 verse 7, and this occurs 45 years after Joshua spied out the land, Joshua 14 verse 7, 8, 9 and 10. The spies were sent out in 1442 before Christ, one year after leaving Egypt. Proof of that, Numbers 1, 1, and Numbers 13, verse 1. So, let's try to summarize this, that we can establish a relationship between the 430 years and the 400 years. Okay, birth of Abraham, 1972 before Christ. Covenant confirmed when Abraham was 99 years old, 1873 before Christ. Death of Abraham, 1797 before Christ. Exodus and law given at Pentecost, 1443 before Christ. Period between 1873 before Christ, when the covenant was confirmed with Abraham, to the law given at Pentecost in 1443 before Christ is 430 years. Period of wandering of Israel from, Pen, uh, from the Pentecost when the law was given in 1443 before Christ to the entering of the promised land in 1403 BC is 40 years. Period of six years during which Israel divided the land brings us to 1397 before Christ. From death of Abraham in 1797 before Christ to the year when the division of the promised land was completed in 1397 before Christ, there are 400 years. No, there are no contradictions in the Bible. The Bible is perfectly inspired, flawless word of God. Galatians 4.10 And here is another of uh, favorite scriptures, particularly when it comes to the Protestant world. And they just love to point out that this scripture indeed says that no, we should not keep the Sabbath and the holidays in the New Testament. Galatians 4.10 Paul says, You observe days and months and times and years. And let me just uh, uh, interject this thought. It, it, just, uh, it, it just amazes me the flaw, flaw logic, logic of those various Protestants who simply, when, I mean, simple logic tells us that the Gospels must be the Gospels of Christ speaking about the life of Christ and his mission. The Gospels, you know, when, when they describe Christ in detail, are certainly of the highest authority in the New Testament. Is that logical? And then from that, then the rest flows. 
Then we have the book of Acts when the the when Jesus Christ is still after his resurrection from the dead, he's still with his disciples, he's still teaching them, reminding them, establishing them before he ascended back to heaven. And then in the book of Acts we have the uh, story of the of the apostles of Jesus Christ and the early church that was founded by him on the day of Pentecost. They continue in his footsteps. Everywhere in the book of Acts we see that Christ's apostles kept the Sabbath and all the holidays, except for the Feast of, Tab- uh, Feast of Trumpets, which nevertheless we know that the trumpets are the... Uh, Announcement of his of Christ's coming, his return in the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, so we know that's why we know what the Feast of Trumpets means. But anyway, all the other holidays, other than the Day of Trumpets, other than the Day of Trumpets, are mentioned in the Book of Acts and the, the Apostles. And the early church kept them after the death and after the resurrection and ascension to heaven of Jesus Christ. So, the Apostle Paul was called later by a miracle and miraculous intervention but nevertheless he was the he was not one of the original 12 but he was called later now does it make any sense that the writings of the apostle paul including galatians and all these others that we we have analyzed so far romans the first and second corinthians does it make sense that the later called apostle would abrogate uh, 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 abolish do away with god's law does that make any sense? Could the writings of the Apostle Paul be preceding the authority of the Gospels, in which we read that Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath and the holidays? It does, does that make any sense? No, it makes no sense whatsoever. So I hope that there is out there, there are still some of you individuals that will just come to your senses. If Jesus Christ established and he said that he did not come to abolish the law, but instead to fulfill the law, to give us the example of how to keep the law. And the whole four Gospels testify about it to us. If we see in the book of Acts that after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his church, his apostles continue to keep both the Sabbath and holidays, meaning the law of God. Well then, how can the apostle that was called later be the one who will supposedly abolish the law of God. That, does that make any sense? No, it does not. And after all, the Apostle Paul was, before his conversion, before he accepted Jesus Christ as his Messiah, the Apostle Paul was a, a, a zealous follower of the law. He kept the law of God in Pharisee commander though, all of his life. So what do you what do you expect? And then he converted in his later age when he was called to join the mission and the work and to follow Jesus Christ, just as the early church followed Jesus Christ and just as the apostles followed Jesus Christ in the original twelve. He was called to follow Jesus Christ and be his follower and follow the way of Jesus Christ. Well, what would you think that he then in later age he would all of a, all of a sudden start eating pork and unclean stuff? That he would just uh, give up on the Sabbath and keep Sunday, the, the, the ancient pagan worship of the sun, that he would, you know, uh, keep the, 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 the pagan holidays, holidays of the Romans, Romans who occupied his home country, the Romans who were occupiers. Does that make any sense? No, it does not. A common sense should tell you that something is wrong, something is flawed with this kind of thinking. That everyone, as far as is mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospels, then in the book of Acts, we have the early church keeping the law of God, and then the later apostle Paul, who was, you know, called to join the original church and to follow Christ's example of keeping the Sabbath and holidays, that he would just come and abrogate the law, please. Well, where is the logic there? So, it's, so that that uh, that would mean that the uh, the authority of the apostle Paul supersedes the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. And yet, you know, there are all those Protestants who keep 
constantly calling on the name of Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. Well, if Jesus is the highest authority, why don't you follow his example in the Gospels? Why don't you follow the example of his early church and his apostles in the book of Acts? And how can you proclaim the Apostle Paul to be the one who has done away with the law of God? Does that make any sense? Not at all. Not at all. It's totally senseless. And no wonder, speaking to you Protestants in particular, that you're completely disoriented now. You're no longer, you don't even know what you're protesting against anymore. What are you protesting against? You tell me. At one point, in the Middle Ages, you were protesting against the Catholic Church and the abuse of religious authority by the Catholic Church. Okay. That much. Your reforms has had, your reforms did not go too far. You just reformed a little bit of the Catholic system and you just formed your own. Okay. But what are you protesting against now? Now you're joined back to the mother, mother church in Rome. And it seems the only thing that you're protesting against is basically the law of God. And the people of God who keep the law of God. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm alluding to Revelation. And speaking of Revelation, in, in the very last chapter of Revelation, Revelation 22, it says, There are blessed those who keep the commandments of God. But aside all the theological arguments, I'm logic, common sense... People, you who really want the Bible, you you who really want to follow what the Bible says, the logic, the common sense is lacking in the Protestant theology. Writings of the Apostle Paul cannot supersede in authority the Gospel of Jesus Christ in which we see that he kept the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, Mark chapter 2. He kept the holidays just like his parents did. His early church was founded on one of the holidays of the day of Pentecost, kept all the holidays, kept the Sabbath, nowhere in the book of Acts do you have one example of any apostle of the church keeping Sunday. Nowhere, even after his resurrection, and he, by the way, he did not rose from the dead, he did, not, he did not come back to life on Sunday anyway. That's one of the greatest errors of modern Christianity. But aside Aside with, uh, aside, let's put that aside. Nowhere do we have keeping Sunday and keeping pagan holidays anywhere in the book of Acts after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then comes the Apostle Paul, whom that very Jesus Christ called miraculously, as we remember, Acts chapter 9. And you have made Paul somebody who abrogated or did away or abolished or annulled the law of God. And Paul was called by the very Messiah to follow in his footsteps and follow his example of life. Could you imagine, can you imagine Paul eating shrimp, you know, after 30 years of faithfully adhering to the law of God and never eating anything unclean and keeping the Sabbath in a pharisaical manner, keeping all the law of God but without the Messiah. No, I cannot imagine him doing that. In any case, again, aside all theology, theology and theological arguments, the common sense people tell, tells us that the writings of the Apostle Paul cannot supersede the authority of Jesus Christ established in the Gospels. And certainly not, cannot supersede the authority of the other Apostles who spent 40 days after the resurrection of Christ with Christ and continued to keep the law of God. Galatians 4.10, Paul says, You observe days and months and times and years. Please, it says months. Where does it say you observe the Sabbath, you observe the holidays? Does it say it anywhere? No. Days, months, times and years. And many use this verse, of course, to show that Paul did away with the holidays and with the Sabbath, which he, by the way, kept till the end of his life. Paul wrote... But, we are reading now Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. But, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and 
beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. Notice the language again. So they served all those when they were pagans. They served their pagan gods in pagan days and their Sundays. And they were in bondage of sin and bondage of foreign gods that are not gods, God of Israel, that is not God of Israel. You observe days and months and seasons, times and years. This is New King James Version. Galatians 4, verse 8, 9 and 10. Now did Paul mention God's holidays? Such as the days of unleavened bread, uh, the feast of tabernacles or the Sabbath? No. He said days and months and seasons or times and years. Something altogether different. Paul began the fourth chapter by addressing the Jews. In the fourth chapter he wrote we. Because Paul himself was a Jew. That's uh, fourth chapter. And then in Galatians 4, 6, he began addressing the non-Jewish converts. He did not say we, but he said you. He said that there was a time when they did not know God. We read that in verse 8. The Jews knew God, but the Gentiles, non-Jews, had not known him before they heard the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom of God which Jesus Christ preached when he came to the Galilee and began preaching the gospel saying, repent now, the time has come, repent and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe that gospel, that the kingdom of God is coming to replace this corrupt satanic world. So the Jews knew God, but the Gentiles, non-Jews, had not known him before they heard the gospel. Jesus said to the Gentile Samaritan woman, you, the Gentiles, Worship what you do not know. We, we the Jews, know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. That was in John 4, 22, the famous conversation of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, the converts to whom Paul is now writing were not Jews. They were Gentiles by birth. And in times past... They did not know God and they were cut off from God. As it says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. They had been serving demons and idols, not the living God. False teachers were coming among them, perverting the gospel, beguiling them to turn again to their former ways. They were leaving the gospel to return to days and months and seasons and years. They could not be returning to God's holidays because they never kept them in the past. They did not keep them before Paul preached about them. In Leviticus chapter 19 verse 26 and in Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 and 14 we find that Moses, according to the command of God, ordered the people not to observe times. To observe times, originally, was a heathen practice often attached to the heavenly bodies, especially in determining the pagan calendar and the heathen religious seasons. So the whole context is heathenism, heathen days, heathen months, heathen seasons, heathen years, has nothing to do with the law of God and God's holidays. The Catholic bishop Chrysostom, who lived in the 4th century, admits that these superstitious times... Paul forbids that those these that we're reading in Galatians, these superstitious times Paul forbids were pagan customs practiced by Christians in his day, as in the days of old. Chrysostom, the famous Catholic bishop, does admit that, and he's also very popular in the Orthodox world. The Easter Sunday uh, liturgy in the in the Serbian Orthodox Church is the Chrysostom's liturgy, and Chrysostom's liturgy is used, I think for perhaps all the liturgies throughout the year, but especially for, uh, certainly for the Easter Sunday liturgy. Anyway, he admits this bishop that the superstitious times were pagan customs practiced by Christians, under quotation mark Christians in his day, as in the days of old. And here is the quote from Christosdom. Christosdom says, Many were superstitiously addicted to divination. In the celebration of these times, 
they set up lamps in the marketplace and crown their doors with garlands. End of the quote. This is from Bingham's Antiquities of the Christian Church, pages 1123 and 1124. Now, besides times, the Greeks observed special days in honor of the dead. And that practice, brethren, is still present in uh, some parts of the Eastern world, including uh, Serbia. And here is the uh, quote from Hutton Webster, Rest Days, page 79. The rites took place on the unlucky days, accompanied by complete idleness and cessation of business. End of the quote. Now, brethren, these Gentile Galatians, what they were doing? They were returning to the customs of doing penance on the old pagan days. And Paul denounced this vain and abominable practice. We are not to learn the way of the heathen, as we are admonished in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, and in Deuteronomy 12, verse 29, 30, 31 and 32. Now, in connection with the old pagan system, were many days observed as idolatrous festivals of penance. These days were consecrated to deities of the state religious cults, and they were unlucky, under quotation mark, unlucky, because of the supposed influence of the gods. They were set aside as periods of penance because they were regarded as unsuitable for many purposes, both public and private, for battles, say sacred rites, journeys and marriages. We are told that they owed their unlucky quality to the pronouncement of the senate and pontiffs. That's again from the same source that I've just uh, referred to you. Uh, rest days, Hutton Webster, page 17 this time. So now do you understand what is the context of Paul's writings? Now as many as one third of the old Greek and Roman calendars were marked as unlawful for judicial and political business on which the state expected the citizens to abstain from their private business and labor. This is again, I'm reading from the same, quotes from the same source, this time pages 30 or uh, 304 and 305. So no wonder that the Paul spoke of days, you see, days, but not holidays, but the days. And how many religious and non-religious people still have similar beliefs about certain days, such as unlucky Friday the 13th? Notice that Paul also condemns the custom of observing months and years. You see, certain months of the year were considered sacred to the Greek gods. For example, to the Greek god Apollo, sacred was April and October. To Artemis or Artemida, sacred was April. To Bacchus, sacred was January. To Zeus, sacred month was February and June. And there are many others. Also, entire years were set aside every two and four years. And during these special years, national idolatrous feasts were held and the Olympic... Games, East Chimian Games, Nemean Games, Pythian Games were celebrated. Every one of these was connected with idolatrous worship and ceremony. Oh. Recently there were Winter Olympic Games in China. And there are always Olympic Games. Oh, well, you have probably discovered now something else about the games. It was all connected with idolatrous worship and ceremony. Okay. In short then, Paul was forbidding Gentile converts to return to these heathen practices of observing days, months, times and years. At the same time, he was not forbidding them to keep God's holidays. In fact, how could he forbid them when he preached those holidays to them and they became converted as a result of his preaching? So now, hopefully, we have finally uh, put an end to some nonsense and nonsensical interpretation of the book of Galatians.